So you've learned a little bit about watch servicing and now you're ready to go out and start buying some watches to fix. But with literally tens of thousands of options, how do you know what watches to buy so you don't end up spending two or three hundred dollars for a watch that's only worth a hundred bucks? Today we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of different types of watches you can buy and what's going to be best for your situation and your skill level at this point. The first thing you need to think about is what's the end goal? Is your goal just to take a watch apart and be able to figure out how to put it back together? Or is your goal to actually take a watch that you can fix and make it a usable part of a new watch collection? So if the goal is only to practice on a random movement, the only thing I would suggest is to buy one that may be usable as a parts movement in the future that would be in a watch that you might want to put in your collection. Now, when we think about places to actually buy watches, eBay is going to be the first thing that comes to mind. eBay is going to give you the largest selection of watches to choose from, including Swiss, Japanese, and American brands. Sites like Chrono24 are not really a great option if you're looking for watch movements that are going to be more value-based or inexpensive, and you're certainly not going to find any parts movements or practice movements there. Now, as you're searching eBay, you're going to see movements that are the movement only, sometimes with a dial, and then you're going to find watches that are complete with the movement and the case. One of the biggest mistakes that new watchmakers make is buying the movement only with the expectation that they're going to be able to find a case to put that movement in. If you don't understand that watch cases are actually designed around movements, you need to have the correct width, but even more importantly, the dimension between the top of the dial and the center of the stem has to be the same in the movement as well as the case or it's just not gonna work. And with the tens of thousands of different movements available, the chances of you finding a case to fit that movement are pretty slim. Now, with the exception of certain movements like an ETA 2824 or some Seiko movements like the 7S26 and some of the other variants that are out there, you're not going to find a lot of cases to fit those. So if this is a avenue that you really want to explore, then what I would do is find an empty case first and then figure out what type of movement went in that case. And then you can search for that particular movement and you'll know that you have a case that matches up with it. When you first start buying vintage movements to repair, ideally you want to find movements that are actually working. They may be running poorly, but at least they're running. Ask questions of the buyer. Make sure that the balance is operating and find out any other known problems it may have. The last thing you want to do is buy a watch that you have to start sourcing parts for, especially balance wheels. Finding a balance in hairspring combination that is in good shape and is actually going to fit into the movement you have is not as easy as it may sound. And it's not like you can just buy a new hairspring if the hairspring's messed up. Just remember that no matter what you buy vintage-wise, there's never any guarantees that the watch is going to be a good runner. But at least if all the parts are there, you have a fighting chance of getting it going. Now, if you see a particular watch that you are interested in, do a quick search on eBay. See if there's any available part movements that are out there. Buying some one-of-a-kind Swiss watch that you can't even identify lowers your chances of having a watch that you're going to be able to service to completion. I can't even begin to tell you the amount of people that I talk to that have watches that they've purchased that end up buying two or three more movements to try to put them together to create one. 
There's going to be plenty of learning opportunities as you get into servicing vintage watches. Just don't start off with more than you can chew. So how do you know how much you should pay for one of these old watches? Well, it's actually pretty simple if you're using eBay. All you have to do is search for what you're looking for. And then if you go to the advanced tab, you can scroll down and turn on the sold button and it will pull up all the listings that match your search criteria and it will show you what other people paid for the same thing or something very similar. I hear a lot of people talking about saving money on tools that they need to buy, but those same people go out and they'll just randomly buy whatever's out there and end up having a drawer full of movements that don't work. Depending on what you're interested in, there's two main categories of watches that you can service. Quartz and mechanical. I think some people are under the misconception that buying quartz watches to practice on or to restore is the least expensive way to go. You know, it's like, all I gotta do is clean it up a little bit, put a new battery in, and I gotta, and I gotta work and watch. Sometimes that's true. What a lot of people don't realize is that troubleshooting a quartz movement requires specialized testing equipment. Now, yes, you can check the continuity of a coil with a multimeter, but that's really about it. One of the bigger problems with quartz watches is leaking batteries have destroyed the electronics or it's become so dirty inside the movement that it consumes way more energy from the battery than those batteries are designed for and therefore it'll work for a short time but then it stops again. Now with the problems that are associated with the circuit boards and coils and battery consumption, not to mention the lack of parts that are available for quartz watches. These things get recirculated over and over through eBay. One person buying it, they can't fix it, they put it back for sale, and it just rotates through eBay over and over and over again. So if your thing is quartz watches, that's cool. The only thing that I would recommend is that determine what the caliber in the quartz watches, and then do a quick search to see if there's a replacement available, just in case you can't fix that one. And whatever you do, don't make the mistake of thinking that if I can't get the quartz movement working, I'm gonna just put in a mechanical movement because it doesn't work that way. First of all, quartz movements are much thinner than your typical mechanical movement. So the watch cases in a quartz movement are almost always gonna be thinner. Then you have the issues with the top of the dial measurement, with the center of the stem, the length of the cannon pinion, and all these other things that just make a conversion from quartz to mechanical almost impossible. Now, when you're looking for mechanical watches, the first thing you should understand is that the older the watch is, the less likely you're going to be able to fix it, at least at this point in your career. Early pocket watches from around the 1850s in that general area used a movement called a fusey movement, which is extremely hard to work on, especially if you don't have tooling. You got to have a lot of equipment to fix these things because finding parts is next to impossible. So unless you have a lot of experience behind you, I would stay away from watches that are almost 200 years old. Next, you have pocket watches, both Swiss and American, from the early 1900s to up until about 1940 or 1950. People tend to gravitate towards these because they're large movements, they're relatively simple in design, and if we're talking about most of the American pocket watches, they're freaking beautiful. But understand this, they can be extremely challenging to work on. Now, when you look at the Swiss versus American pocket watches, they use two completely different systems for manufacturing. 
in the Swiss industry, you had people that made what's called Ebach movements, which was the main plate, the bridges, and the barrel. And that's all they made. Then you had other small manufacturers, could be a guy with one or two employees, who made a specialized product, like he made a mainspring, or let's say he made the click, or he made pinions, or he made wheels, whatever it is, there's all these little tiny shops that specialized in making one part. And then you had people who assembled these movements. So they would buy the raw Ebok from these guys, and then they would source out all the parts to complete the watch, then they would assemble everything into a finished movement. Now, back in those days, there was very little, I mean very little, documentation from Swiss companies about the movements themselves. And parts availability wasn't even thought about at that time. So unless you're working on a Swiss movement like a Longines and a couple other ones who actually did keep records, you're going to have a hard time even identifying what the movement is, much less finding any replacement parts. It wasn't until much later when the Swiss saw what the American watchmakers were doing before they even started making parts available. So that now brings us around to the American companies, which operated in a totally different way. They were the first to standardize watch production by making all their parts in-house, assembling all the parts in the movement in-house, and actually making parts available. They used model numbers. They put serial numbers on their movements so that they could be identified by watchmakers to be able to service the watch later on. Now, that's great, but what you have to remember is that the watchmaking industry was way different back then. First of all, you didn't have a whole lot of hobbyist watchmakers out there. Even though parts were standardized, it was still expected that the watchmaker can actually fit the part to the movement. I mean, this was a great advantage because watchmakers didn't have to make it from scratch. He may just need to burnish a pivot a little bit in order for it to fit the jewel. Back in those days, Parts were not really just drop in like they are today. And even though you will find some that are, if you're trying to replace parts in a balance wheel, as an example, that has a broken balance staff, there may be six or seven different part numbers that will actually fit in that same watch that have different size pivots. So you're going to need to be able to match that up to the jewel stone. So again, American pocket watches, I love them, but they're definitely challenging when you're first starting out. Now, another issue that comes up with American pocket watches specifically is you never know what the current condition of the movement is in the respect of how many people have worked on it. How many people, just like you, have worked on it? You can never assume that the watch is in original condition from the perspective of the parts that are in it. A lot of times people will throw in a balance wheel into a pocket watch just to say it has a balance wheel. It doesn't even belong in there. Seiko's a great brand if you're brand new because they have movements again like the 7S26 and some of the other ones that they have. There's plenty of parts movements available so that you will at least be able to fix something. There's plenty of good Swiss movements that have parts availability. You've got the entire ETA line, you've got FHF, you got AS Child. The only thing I would recommend, if you see a watch, identify what kind of movement it has, and then just do a quick search to see if there's any part movements available. Now, if you want to see a video about how to source parts for these, let me know in the comments and I'll make a video about it. Now, another suggestion that I would make to you is to start off with a movement like a NH36. 
This is a movement that you can buy relatively inexpensively that you can make big improvements on its performance. What most people don't realize is that a movement, the NH36 is a division of Seiko, and these movements are sold basically to anybody else who wants to make a watch. When these movements come from the factory, they have minimal, if any, lubrication and no regulation to speak of. You can take one of these movements in new condition and you can take it apart. You can service it. You can re-lubricate it with what you've learned already. And you can have a movement that will perform outstanding. Then you can buy a case for it, and then you will have a watch that's part of your collection, that's one that you made, that will mean more to you than probably anything else you could possibly make or do with this hobby, and you will learn tons from it. The main thing you'll learn is whether or not your servicing is good enough at this point to start working on vintage watches. And basically what I'm referring to is, at this point, you should know how to clean and lubricate movements, which means that you should be able to take a watch that has no problems, that is in working order, and you should be able to completely service this movement and actually improve its performance from the point of when you received it. If you can't do that, if you can't take a new movement with no problems and service it so that it performs at least as good from the time you got it, if not even better, then you're gonna have a real hard time servicing a vintage movement which has, God only knows what kind of problems. So it's a, it's a good way to start as you're building your skills. If it hasn't become apparent to you already, a good microscope is absolutely a game changer in watch repair. If you can't see what you're working on, then you have zero chances of fixing it. Microscopes bring a whole nother dimension into watch repair so that you can see what you're working on in a way that you could never do with a loop. Now, microscopes can get very expensive, but they don't have to be. This particular one that I use, I do 90% of my work right under this in perfect comfort, and I can do it all day long. So if you have any interest in exploring microscopes more, especially the setup I use, then let me know in the comments, and I'll be glad to make a video about it. And because there's so much more to learn, I'll see you in the next video.